Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the Draper Fisher Jurvetson Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Seminar brought to you by the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students. This special event is archived for future viewing on Stanford's Entrepreneurship Corner website at ecorner.stanford.edu and by SCPD, the Stanford Center for Professional Development. My name is Heidi Roizen, and I'm a venture partner at DFJ, as well as an adjunct faculty member here in the Department of Management Science and Engineering, where I teach 178 winter quarter. Please come. <laughs> Just had to throw that little pitch in. Uh, today, we are proud to be hosting some very special guests at ETL as we discuss the entrepreneurial environment of Stanford and the results of the recent Stanford Innovation Survey, which sought to assess the university's economic impact based on entrepreneurial activity by alumni, faculty, and staff. And of course, we want to acknowledge and thank Sequoia Capital for generously funding the Stanford Innovation Survey. To tee up this discussion, I would now like to welcome up the authors of the Stanford Innovation Project, Stanford Innovation Report, MS&E Assistant Professor Chuck Easley, and Professor Emeritus from the Graduate School of Business, Bill Miller, to share some of the central findings and historical context of the results from the survey. Gentlemen. Well, Heidi, thank you very much for the introduction and getting us all started here. I just want to say one thing. You know, here at Stanford, we're talking about uh, teaching young entrepreneurs to be, young people to be entrepreneurs. You know, you can be an old entrepreneur. <laughs> it's OK. You know, I'm an old entrepreneur. And if you miss that chance when you're young, you still have a chance when you're old, so don't forget that. Uh, but I want to put some context into this report. Uh, you know, we talk about a lot about entrepreneurship, and it's very big, and you'll hear some results from Chuck that are very impressive. Uh, but Stanford is about a lot more than just entrepreneurship. I just want to put that context. Uh, we I uh, have a lot of uh, interest in the, in the arts and in, in the humanities and so forth. And our students explore this. Uh, in the first two years as an undergraduate, as most of you who are undergraduates know, you don't have to declare your major until uh, you decide what you want to do. We think entrepreneurship is a career choice among many career choices. And some students will want to be poets, they'll want to be biologists, they'll want to be lawyers and some will want to be entrepreneurs. And so for those who want to be entrepreneurs, we have a lot of ways that we can help them. So it is a career choice, and we help them on that career. And so we have workshops. We have courses like this. Uh, we have mentors who will help them uh, develop their, their skills, uh, learn the skills of entrepreneurship, and get mentored on what it is that they can do to become better entrepreneurs. So we've had a, a, a large number of them across the university, not just out of engineering, not just out of the School of Business. We have social entrepreneurs. And as Chuck, I think, may report, that uh, we've had a lot of uh, nonprofits started by uh, Stanford graduates, uh, almost as many as, as for-profits started by Stanford graduates. So we have a very broad sense of education. And that was always very important to me because uh, my father was a farmer, but my mother was a classics professor. So I had to learn a lot of classics. And I felt that breadth was very important to me when I began to think about uh, things like starting companies. I started a little bit later in life than many of you, uh, but that breadth of knowledge was very important. So getting that breadth, I, we think, is quite critical. So now we're going to hear from Chuck. Here's Chuck, who's going to talk about more of the details of the report. Great. Thank you, Bill. So this all started for me a few years ago when I first arrived at Stanford back in the summer of 2009. And like all of you, you start seeing these examples and hearing these stories about successful entrepreneurs and alumni and faculty going on to start companies out of their research and their technology. And so I began to wonder, what's the overall impact of all of this? If we were to sum together the, the aggregate of all of this entrepreneurial activity uh, that Stanford is producing through 
uh, students, through alumni who have passed through Stanford and been exposed to the entrepreneurial environment or been exposed to some new technology, through faculty, what would the, what would the aggregate results of that be? And so I set out to do a survey of all Stanford alumni, uh, faculty, and staff. And so this, this was a large undertaking, obviously. We sent the survey out to 143,000 Stanford alumni. So this covers across uh, the schools, across graduation years. So we got responses from alumni going back from the 1930s uh, up through graduates uh, uh, from 2010. And so we got back, out of these 143,000, we got back 27,000 responses. Uh, so this is both from entrepreneurs and from non-entrepreneurs. And so if you use that data, uh, which took a lot of time to, to crunch the numbers and, and add, add all of this up, you wind up with um, 39,900 still surviving companies have been created over the decades by Stanford alumni and faculty, which have created 5.4 million new jobs and annual worldwide revenues of $2.7 trillion. So Stanford on the whole is having a large impact on the economy both locally and globally. And Stanford is, on the whole, importing founders into the state of California. So just under 35% of the newly admitted uh, students at Stanford are from California, but 45% of the alumni founders wind up founding their companies in California. So I just want to highlight two other quick results, and then there's a lot more uh, in the report, which you can download uh, from the website, but two other interesting results just to kind of pique your interest. One is, you know, as, as students, you may be looking out at the various programs and business plan competitions and courses and wondering, should I get involved in these? Should I work on my startup on the side? What should I do? And so we asked people who responded to the survey, these are graduates um, uh, going back in time, uh, which aspects of Stanford did you interact with and were important in founding your venture? And so we gave them various options for taking an entrepreneurship course, participating in a business plan competition, and so on. And so, as you might expect, those who were innovators, who produced some sort of patent, new business process, new product, and those who were entrepreneurs were slightly more likely to, to take these entrepreneurship courses. But the surprising result came when we looked at those who founded a company within three years of graduating and who had managed to raise venture capital in their firms. Um, and so 25% of the innovators and entrepreneurs in the aggregate had participated in an entrepreneurship course of some type. But 60% of those quick founders who had been able to raise venture capital within three years had taken an entrepreneurship course. And similar results for the um, programs and business plan competitions, STVP, Center for Entrepreneurial Studies, and, and the D School. The other interesting result um, comes around, we asked the founders if they had um, changed their business model. So we asked them, is the business that you're running now very similar to the business model, the vision that you had in the beginning. And we gave them several categories. Did the target customers change? Did the revenue model change? Did the sales channels change? And so we found that 60% of the founders indicated that they had changed the business model from the beginning. And in particular, um, only 13% said they had the same target customers as they thought they would in the beginning. So you know, the classic thing, look to your left, look to your right. If, we look at, if, we, if you look to your left, then probably if you're all founders, the person to your left is going to wind up changing their target customer from what they think it would be. And if there are 200 people in the room, then perhaps only 26 of you are going to wind up choosing the right initial target customer in the beginning. So we also looked at the performance implications of this. And I'll tell you just briefly a, a, a couple of interesting results. So when you look on the whole, those who had changed their business model have slightly lower performance than those who stayed with their initial vision. The differences aren't large, but median revenues of 150,000 compared to 200,000. So, but when you look in particular at the software and internet firms, those who had changed their business model in some way wind up having higher revenues than those who did not. Uh, so about 500,000 median revenues compared to 200,000. So I think that this shows that one, it's perhaps more about the insights into the correct business model that you get than about a particular number of times or, or whether you've changed the business model or not. 
And the second thing is that there may be some industry differences, uh, where particularly for software and internet firms where uncertainty is higher, uh, then there may be bit more benefit from these changes. So those are the um, quick findings that I wanted to leave you with. Um, these are uh, some of the early results. There's a lot more in the um, report that's available for download, um, and a lot more that we'll be uh, looking at as, as the research group continues with this going forward. So I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Heidi. Thank you very much. Yeah. I encourage you all to look at the report. It's absolutely fascinating. I mean, really, really amazing stuff there. So I, I think what we're going to try to do now is uh, put a personal face on the idea of Stanford and entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial alumni. And if I can ask our alumni guests to come up and uh, join me here. And uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to try to you know, take, a, take a while to run through some questions that. Uh, I get to ask first because I'm up here and you're not, and then um, you guys can uh, you guys can chime in with some questions before we before we run out of time at 5:30. So, uh, what I thought we'd first do is is I'd like each of you to introduce yourselves. So, uh, my name's Kit Rogers, and I am a graduate class of 1996 in product design. Uh, anybody study product design? Oh my gosh, all CS. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I studied product design and uh, came here being pre-med, actually, I think. Who here at least came being pre-med, at least? All right, a few. So um, did that, uh, was a walk-on on the football team, had never played football before, so that was kind of an interesting experience. And because of that entrepreneurial experience, um, which resulted in a lot of bruises and late nights, uh, Tom Byers uh, uh, recruited me into what became the Mayfield Fellows Program, and I ended up uh, being in the first year of the Mayfield Fellows Program. Um, I studied uh, engineering management uh, for my graduate degree, which was part of the in industrial engineering department, and uh, am now a veteran of four startup companies after graduating from that. Fantastic. Well, I also came here uh, looking to be pre-med, studied human biology for two years, um, and then dropped out to start a biotechnology company, Stem Cell Theranostics. Um, in the process, have also founded um, an industry-specific vertical within StartX called StartX Med to support other medical innovators coming out of Stanford. It's way more impressive than me. Um, I came starting to think I was going to be computer science, and it turns out I was computer science. Um, <laughs> so I'm also not super creative. I didn't pivot. Um, I was class of 04 undergrad, 05 co-term. Uh, I also did walk onto the crew team, having never rode in my life before. Um, that was interesting. Uh, and less, fewer bruises and more sore muscles, maybe. Uh, but it worked out pretty well. Uh, joined the Mayfield Fellows Program uh, in 04. So Tom and Tina got me too. Um, one of the better things I think I did at Stanford. Um, and then actually stayed with my Mayfield internship uh, full time after school for a while at Fortify. Uh, went to Microsoft for a couple of years and then started a company with another Stanford CS grad and Mayfield fellow, Clara. Um, and we now run that company and with the generous help of Roloff's bank account. <laughs> I'm uh, Roloff Boerta. I'm originally from South Africa. Uh, I came to Stanford in 1998 to go to the business school and was attracted to come to Silicon Valley because of the promise of entrepreneurship. Um, Living very far away from here, it seemed an incredible place of innovation and um, sort of a willingness to experiment and take on the world. Uh, before graduating in 2000, I actually didn't drop out, but I joined a com little company at the time called PayPal, which was down the street at uh, on University Avenue, actually in the same office that Google had on University Ave. And I uh, worked for them part-time for one semester before I joined full time and I eventually became the CFO uh, to take the company public in 2002. And after that I joined Sequoia Capital, uh, where I've been since the beginning of 2003. Um, invested in a couple of companies that include uh, you know, YouTube, uh, Square, Evernote, uh, a couple of companies like that. When I checked earlier today, half the companies that I'm involved with have Stanford founders. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time coming back to Stanford University and certainly have lived firsthand a lot of the observations from the report in terms of the, this part of positive feedback cycle and loop between industry, uh, faculty, and students. Uh, and I certainly attended this class uh, just over 10 years ago myself. Great. Thank you. And I do want to state for the record that I also was a Stanford undergrad, class of 80. 
Um, I got my degree in creative writing. Uh, and then I went out into the workforce and I discovered that creative writing degrees were not super highly valued. Um, but but um, Tandem Computers was just getting off the ground and they needed someone to write their company newspaper. And I only bring this up because I want all of you who are getting English degrees or writing degrees to understand that it really does have value when you get out there in the real world and have to communicate. And when people say to me, you know, what's been one of your most valuable skills from Stanford, I got to tell you, writing and communicating has been tremendously valuable to me. So I did come back and get an MBA and started a company right out of business school with my brother who was a computer science guy, although from Cal. But that's OK. Somebody has to hire them. No, God. <laughs> Shouldn't say that. I know, I know, I'll get in trouble. So moving right along. Um, you know, Chuck mentioned that approximately 25% of the technical innovators uh, said that they took an entrepreneurship course at Stanford. So I'm just wondering if any of you, did you, did you take entrepreneurial courses at Stanford? And how do you think that influenced you in, in your um, in your entrepreneurial endeavors after that. And I'm just going to throw them open, and any one of you want to say something, any one of you want to tag on, go knock yourself out. Sure, so I'll, I'll start. I, did, I took this class, um, as much as that comes from an entrepreneurial class, uh, certainly entrepreneurial focused, and I did Mayfield Fellows, and that was it. Um, but it, Mayfield Fellows was, was three classes, really, and that was huge. That was probably one of the more formative experiences for me, both at Stanford and as, and as a founder. And we go back to that today. I was telling somebody earlier, uh, I think John, as we walked in, that probably half of my best friends from college are from the Mayfield program, um, in addition to my co-founder, um, five, four or five people at the company, and, uh, and most of the people I turn to for support. Any, taken? Any classes? Right. Sure, I'm Mayfield? Mayfield Fellow also, before it was called Mayfield Fellows, and um, you know, very close with my classmates there as well. So that actually very much did expose me to the world of entrepreneurship. Before that, I'm not sure I could have spelt it. Uh, still have trouble with it, honestly. Um, and uh, it was a, a really great experience. Before that, I would have become a doctor, and that would have been too, but um, kind of opened a whole new world up to me. And, and after that, uh, just uh, have been four startups in a row, as I mentioned. So for me, that was the one class. I'm not sure there were a lot of other classes back in the mid-'90s about entrepreneurship. Maybe there were one or two, but it's not like it is now. So. Of course, Stanford's reputation today is 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 huge as, a, as an epicenter of entrepreneurship. And um, the study also indicated that 55% of the respondents who became entrepreneurs in the last decade chose Stanford in part because of its entrepreneurial environment. For each of you, why Stanford? Did that have anything to do with why you chose to come here? In my case, it was, a, as I mentioned earlier, it was a huge deciding factor. And I didn't really understand what it meant to be here. I'd never been in the United States before I arrived in August of 98 to come here. Um, but it was a, a huge variable in my decision making. Um, it's actually interesting. One of the things in the report shows that the percentage of people who choose Stanford for entrepreneurship is increasing over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, to me, is sort of very interesting. That, that you get the self-reinforcing effect of the faculty that's here is entrepreneurially minded or interested in collaboration with industry. The students who come self-select and are selected for those attributes. And then this whole environment, whether it's the classes, the people you get to meet in guest lectures, your fellow students, all just creates this infectious environment. And of course, that's, that's uh, mirrored in the amount of concentration of venture capital also being invested in this area. So it's a very virtuous, virtuous yes. cycle. Anyone else about Stanford, other choices, why you did or didn't come? Divya. Absolutely chose Stanford because of its entrepreneurial environment. I think when I applied to Stanford, I didn't really know what entrepreneurship meant, um, but I think it's embodied, um, like it was mentioned earlier, in all the students, in all the faculty members. And to me, it, it kind of means just this sense of being open-minded and, and this almost infectious personality type of people that just aren't afraid to take risks. So definitely drew me to Stanford. Mm -hmm. In my particular case, um, it had nothing to do with it, actually. I just kind of stumbled in here. The reason I came here, three generations of my family went to Cal. Um, <laughs> and so I was contrary in any way. And Division I sports and, and uh, great academics was something I was interested in. So I came. And I think the entrepreneurial environment um, maybe wasn't as well articulated back then as it is now. But you just kind of get swept up in it. And you kind of stumble from a pre-med class to product design to uh, starting companies, and, and it was just the environment that enabled that to happen. It was not a conscious decision in my case, mm -hmm. though. So. Mm -hmm. I think 
I think there's, a, there's an important variable which I haven't been able to find in the report yet, which I think explains why a lot of other people are here too, and explains the success of Stanford, which is the weather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so the funny thing was, I, I chose Stanford uh, over MIT, and I was computer science, and I wanted to do that, and it was the two options, and I, I kind of overgeneralized probably, but thought of MIT as a research institution and Stanford as a business institution, because it was the dot-com bubble when I was making my decision, and there's all these, you know, kind of guys and gals at Stanford that are in, you know, the front page of every magazine and paper launching these giant companies that are worth, you know, billions of dollars overnight, and um, and they're being really successful in building this really cool technology that was kind of the cutting edge. And MIT was always in the paper for Media Lab and like crazy stuff that wasn't going to see the light of day for a while, but was going to be very fundamental. Um, I went and visited both. The funny thing was, MIT had much better weather during Advent Weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Great day in Boston, and it was terrible and rainy here the whole Advent Weekend. <laughs> but I came anyway, specifically because of the business. And I think the thing that to me it wasn't, I didn't call it entrepreneurship or understand it was at the time, but it was very much about the kind of generalist attitude of people at Stanford that was, I'm going to go do lots of different things. There were a ton of people who did really crazy academics and played sports, which I thought was really interesting. There were a ton of people who did a bunch of research and seemed to actually be having a really good time um, in addition to working really hard. And so to me, it was actually the fact that people did a lot of mixed discipline stuff. I was really jealous that the D school started the year I left <coughs> and not the beginning of it, because I thought that was one of the kind of best examples of interdisciplinary studies that, that we've done in a real kind of like way. I'll come back and touch on the interdisciplinary stuff in a little bit as well because I do think that's an important part of Stanford and the Stanford experience. So going back to entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial studying specifically and entrepreneurs, um, when, I, when I was here as a business school student in the, in the 80s and my brother, uh, you know, Actually, he hired me. I will state that for the record because he'll probably watch or he'll, someone will tell him to watch this and I'll get in trouble. So, you know, he hired me uh, in spite of my MBA from Stanford, which he felt had no value in terms of what we were doing. Uh, but then my first act was to talk him into letting me co-found it as the CEO. So I'll just let you be the judge of uh, the value of that degree. But anyway, back then, I remember specifically a classmate of mine saying to me, I cannot believe you just spent all this time and money to get a Stanford MBA, and you're going to throw it away by going to a startup and working with your brother for no money. Um, so, and I remember at the time it was very unusual. I think one of the interesting things about being on campus today is when you walk into a classroom and you say, who wants to be an entrepreneur? Everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. And I know in my time as, a, as an educator here, sometimes people are just dying to be entrepreneurs but they will admit that they don't really know what they want to do. They're just so excited about being an entrepreneur, they want to be an entrepreneur. The point of this is, so we have a lot of entrepreneurship education, but probably everybody's not going to start their own companies. So what advice do you have for students in terms of what is the value of entrepreneurship education, whether or not you're going to be an entrepreneur, and how should you go about navigating what you think you ought to be doing? Rolf? First have at that, because uh, it's something we've thought about a lot at Sequoia, it's just the number of people, entrepreneurship is not synonymous with being a founder. And there's a pioneering spirit and entrepreneurship spirit that pervades Stanford. And I think a lot of the people who have that entrepreneurial dive, drive, go be employee number five or 50 at a great company and live out that entrepreneurship spirit, that willingness to take on challenges, to question the conventional wisdom, and don't confuse that with necessarily starting your own company. Because if you don't have that right idea, then you shouldn't start it. If you're asking people for permission whether or not you should start a company, then you don't have the right idea yet. So be patient and join another company first. And to me, at least, if you look at the, the people that have spun out of PayPal over the years, you know, many of them have subsequently become founders, but they weren't founders of PayPal. So the LinkedIn founders, the Yelp founders, the YouTube founders, they were all you know, Yammer founders. They were all at PayPal, but none of them were the founders of PayPal. But they learned a lot. They clearly had entrepreneurial spirit, and they took that to subsequently start companies. As any of you, as, as you look to also hire and bring people onto your teams, do you, do you think about entrepreneurial education, or how do you look for that entrepreneurial spirit? We definitely, we definitely look for it. Um, and I, I can't honestly say that I think we're very good at judging it. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about it and we think about it, but it's not like we have a secret question that we ask. Um, but I mean, I think to Olaf's point, you don't have to be a founder to be an entrepreneur. 
and that's our most of our company, all of our company at this point, about 100 people are entrepreneurs mm -hmm. um, in the risk that they take and in the in the way that they. I forget Tom and Tina, please don't come up and hit me with a ruler, but I forget the definition of uh, entrepreneurship from Mayfield, but it was, had something to do with you know basically doing extraordinary things with incredibly constrained resources. Mm -hmm. And we think about startups, everybody in a startup has to do that for you to be successful. Um, I think the most interesting question that I've heard people ask um, that I've kind of stolen has been, why are you doing this? Like, if you could kind of fast forward, because a lot of people guys I've seen get into entrepreneurship because they see the big rewards, mm -hmm. and they see, you know, Kevin Systrom from Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's a great story, right? And Kevin's a couple years out of Stanford and got acquired for this big thing, and people are like, I want to go start a company because I want to be like that. And the most interesting question I've heard, and, and some of our early employees asked Clara and I this, I thought it was really cool, um, why are you guys doing this? Like, what if you sold the company tomorrow, what would you do? And the answer for both of us was, start another company, yeah. right? Or keep doing this thing and kind of, you know, we'd take a week off and go have a nice vacation and then work harder. And, yep. and it wasn't about, oh, that'd be great, we'd be done, we're successful. It was kind of like, we're doing it because this is fun. Um, if you didn't sell it, do you mm -hmm. care? I mean, yes. Um, but, but, but it's really about being a, a building something that's cool. No, exactly. I'm no, we, we, we care, but it's about building something cool. Yeah. Uh, in, in my current company, you know, I've been there for nine, nine and a half years, and we were acquired last year, um, and all of us are still at the company. Um, mm -hmm. So we did it because it was the right business move at the time. It gave us the right platform to grow the business in a way that we needed to scale it, and we weren't going to be able to do that on our own. But we're all still there and all intend to be there for a long time. So, um, and we're growing like crazy now. And as we bring people in, we're asking about attributes like, can you build a business inside of this framework? And how do you be entrepreneurial within this framework and that type of thing? So it, it, it does bleed um, into our way of thinking as we're designing new products and, and bringing them to market mm -hmm. for sure. I think one of the things we've talked about a lot, certainly in our classes, and I think we've seen the evidence of this, is anytime an entrepreneur it is financially motivated to be an entrepreneur, it's sort of a failing proposition. Not that you can't think that if there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, that's nice. But anybody who's motivated that that's their goal, and in my experience at least, I've seen them fail over and over and over again because you just don't have the, the fortitude to stick through the difficult times. And the reality is that while we like to read about Instagram or whatever, you know, I, I tell my students, yeah, and every week someone wins the lottery too, but that's not necessarily you. So, uh, but you know, what's interesting also, and this study uh, goes into this, is there are a number of entrepreneurs who set out and build things never intending to make money. And that would be, you know, the social entrepreneurs. The study uh, survey stated that some 30,000 nonprofits have been created by Stanford alumni. I'm just wondering whether any of you have had experience with those folks. Have you done anything like that? Do you think it's unique to the Stanford culture? Do you think it's part of a move? I mean, what's going on with, with that? Yeah, so I'm involved with StartX, which is a great nonprofit organization. And I think it, it, the nonprofit organization mentality is really reflected in the Stanford community in that it's all about how can we help each other to, to move forward. And it isn't really kind of a, a selfish, you know, what's in it for me. It's very much a, a pay it forward mentality, which I think is embodied by, by almost every single Stanford student that's here. Are any of you involved um, either at the board level or otherwise with yeah, some I of these nonprofits? I have a couple of nonprofits in the area and have several friends who have started socially oriented uh, companies and um, end up giving a lot of my money <laughs> to those types of uh, endeavors and um, drive an electric car and all that stuff. So, you know, when you're, when you're in this area, you kind of do it, I think, and it just becomes a part, of, um, a part of your ethos. And when you are successful, you want to give back and do some things that are going to change the world in that way. Um, yeah, I'm not sure 30,000 is a staggering number. I mean, that's yeah. really, really impressive. Um, and I, I guess I'm not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. I know that I tell, you know, I, I um, coach a lot of particularly women in terms of uh, learning entrepreneurship, learning corporate governance, and one of the things that I encourage them to do is get involved with social entrepreneurship, get involved with that, particularly at the, at the board level of a lot of these things, to go in and roll up their sleeves and do something because you really learn a lot as well about interpersonal dynamics and, and, and all of the attributes of a startup, I think, and even more so because certain avenues are, you know, in a way, certain avenues are not available to you in terms of traditional financing and all of that. But in other ways, I think certain avenues are open to you in, in ways that are very different. And I think it's been a really great experience. I know it has been for me. 
Yeah, I mean, like this region is, is a lot more accommodating for those types of uh, startups than maybe some other places on the planet. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're in a good place for all kinds of startups, I think. So talking about this region, hmm. should Stanford do more for this region? Is there something Stanford should do as a member of the greater community here that it's currently not doing? Any ideas? So first, and, and I don't know if this may be a controversial <clears throat> answer or not, I'm actually a really firm believer in kind of focus and dedication to a single mission. And so I would actually argue that no, Stanford is doing exactly what it should do, and it should focus entirely on building great people around it and, and not mix the rest of, of, the, of the kind of, whether mm -hmm. it's nonprofit work or mm -hmm. community service work. Mm -hmm. Like, let the people who are really good at that do that work. Mm -hmm. And Stanford is really good at educating really bright students. Mm -hmm. So I'd say no, it's actually really double down on that mission. Good point. I would like them to allow dogs back at the dish, but other than that, they're doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and more parking. Yes. Okay, we're done though. Okay. That's it. That's it. I mean, has Stanford benefited more from the businesses that have been started in the area, or is it the other way around? I mean, it's a pretty synergistic situation, obviously, um, and difficult to be replicated anywhere mm -hmm. else, I think. Um, it's an interesting question. I, what more could Stanford do? I mean, one of the things Stanford does a great job of, for example, is allowing professors to break away from their professorship. They, they discover a cool technology and then go start a company and then come back. And so that facilitating that kind of a thing is um, really, really cool. Um, and I, I'm not sure if that's done other places mm -hmm. or not, but I, I know a couple of examples here where that's been done. I think the other thing Stanford does, and, and certainly I and Ravi, and there's a number of us who, who are like this, is Stanford welcomes people from the technical and entrepreneurial community to come back and play a role in the education here. And I know it, whether it's at a, a more formal level uh, like we do, where we actually teach a, a whole quarter of a course, or whether it's coming and doing BBLs or, or whatever it is, I think Stanford has been very open and welcoming. And um, you know, I certainly always encourage alumni to come back uh, and, and you know frankly I think because it's very energizing both for the alumni and the students but I think it's something that I hope Stanford will continue to do is encourage people to, to come on board here. So um, I certainly know I've traveled around and, and being from Silicon Valley you know I've been to Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, Silicon Fjord, Silicon Prairie um, and, and certainly also Stanford has a number of relationships with important other educational institutions around the world where they're really trying to learn the best practices not only of our entrepreneurial education but of the, of the ecosystem that makes it work, the Stanford ecosystem. And I think it's one of the things that's very hard to capture. What do you all think about broader than just Stanford but the, the, the ecosystem in which Stanford plays a role here and if you would give advice to anywhere else are there things that can be duplicated? Are there things that can be not duplicated? If you were sitting some in Silicon Fjord, <laughs> what would you do to bring what Stanford has to, to those places? I've certainly thought about this a lot, and I get asked this question when I go back to South Africa, when people look at the success that we've had here. And I think one of the first things I tell them is think about, think about it the same way you think about building a company, which is you have to start small. <laughs> And you have to start iterating. Because the truth is, what, what we all benefit from today took a century to build. And if you go back, and you know, a lot of this is captured in the report, one of the first companies you know, in around this area was Federal Tele Telegraph. And Professor Turman, who had a huge influence on, uh, on Stanford's collaboration with industry, worked there for a while before he became a professor of engineering. And then he taught Hewlett and Packard and a bunch of other very well-known uh, industrialists, he funded some of them. Those companies then spawned successive companies. And then you have this whole phenomenon in economics called you know, clustering that's taken place in the Bay Area where you have not only the research institution, Stanford, you know, giving rise to these wonderful innovations that can help spawn companies, but you have a whole ecosystem of the, the sort of people who go work there, not just the, you know, the Stanford professor or student who starts something, but all the other people that can make it happen, whether it's financing or landlords that understand how to work with startups or lawyers who understand to work with startups. And you get a whole ecosystem developing, and you can't transplant that. It's the same reason you can't just transplant fashion from Milan and plonk it down somewhere else in the world. Um, you know, or diamond cutting in Belgium, or whatever the case is. And so if you want to replicate what is here, you have to very patiently start to build, and you need to create the right foundations 
you know, including things like protection of intellectual property, uh, very clean and efficient bankruptcy system. And these are all things that are taken for granted when you live in a place like this. And they're all necessary institutions for you to encourage the formation of new ventures. So I think it can be done. Um, you know, a long time ago, Fleet Street in London or Savile Row were you know, the, the top of the industries in print and, and fashion or you know, suit making. And those have gone by the wayside as other people have innovated. So it can be done. But you've got to be patient, and you really have to make sure you get all the pieces necessary. I mean, I mean, there's a sense here that you can fail, and that's OK also. And that is not shared in other parts of the planet. Um, you know, I mean, personal bankruptcy, your company fails. I mean, in a lot of other cultures, uh, it's difficult to get back up from that and even get a decent job at a big company after that. Whereas here, I mean, I, we may have a huge number of successful startups. We also have a huge number of failures, probably more than most places. Um, so yeah, not you guys at Sequoia, no, no, but that's right. Yeah. So. <laughs> but but I think that's uh, that's part of it as well. So there's a, a an attitude about starting companies and maybe succeeding and maybe missing. Um, I think the thing that I wondered about is can you replicate that? Because there was something very unique about the West. You know, in the late 19th century, about being a pioneer, it was a new place. You know, it was a very non-denominational, you know, equal access, and it's it really was a meritocracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't perfect meritocracy, but where in the world could you have found a better meritocracy? And you look around the world, and you know, can you replicate that somewhere else? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a former Stanford professor, Paul Romer, who's been on an endeavor to build charter cities. I don't know how many of you are familiar with with these plans for this. And that, to me, in a way, is actually one of the most interesting ideas of replicating what Silicon Valley has, because it takes, gives you an opportunity to take a piece of land and really start with a clean slate. Mm -hmm. And maybe that gives you the opportunity to, to engender that kind of culture. But I think many parts of the world, failure is such a, you know, such a burden on the individual that they wouldn't mm -hmm. risk building a company. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I mean, I, I certainly know there's been successes of, if, if you will, colonizing entrepreneurship. And I certainly know of a number of success stories in the 90s and 2000s of students coming here and seeing something like an eBay take off and say, we're going to go be the eBay of name your country, go there and do it, and, and have tremendous successes. In fact, I'm curious, the study, if the company was founded outside the US but by a Stanford student, were you, did you capture that? OK. And, and what percent of the total revenue? I know it's not fair to really ask this, but I presume there's actually a significant amount of activity outside the US by Stanford students. Yeah, yeah we, could, we could calculate that. We, we do look into the, um, the effect of immigrants coming into the right. Number of immigrants getting into Stanford has been increasing over the decades. And then the percent, about 15% wind up staying in the right. Bay Area. Um, but you're right, uh, um, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but we could go back I and mean, calculate. I mean, the interesting question is, anecdotally, yeah. I at least know of a number of students who, who understood that coming here, learning the best practices, and seeing what was generating escape velocity, uh, escape velocity out in the marketplace, going back and doing it back in their own home territory, created some, some generous future donors for the university, <laughs> I hope, right? You know? <laughs> created some, some great companies out That's there. That's right. So. An interesting yeah, I, I, some, some of the uh, big uh, new Chinese companies would be in the survey, uh -huh. and they were started by Stanford graduates. Right, right. That'd be really interesting to but, know. Uh, just another little context about the size. I didn't mention it <laughs> earlier, but uh, the 2.7 uh, uh, trillion, uh, uh, Bob. Uh, Chuck. 2.7 uh, uh, <laughs> trillion is half the GDP of China. Wow. Now, Revenues and GDP aren't the same thing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it gives you a context of how big that really is. Yeah, it's a it's a big. What what the it was the t it would be tenth the tenth largest, largest economy, economy in the world if it were. That's right. Stanford, the country of Stanford. <laughs> There's a thought for you. It's <laughs> fascinating. I mean, it's huge. It's huge. Yeah. <laughs> so back to multidisciplinary. I want to touch on that before we go on. I you know for me as a creative writing major, my multidisciplinary. Um, uh, endeavor undergrad was I took CS 106, and I and I grad and I passed, <laughs> and I used punch cards. But maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Last class to use punch cards, so I probably shouldn't say that. But uh, but anyway, we we talked about a little bit interdisciplinary and going and doing something different from your core area of focus. Um, 
love to hear from each of you or any of you. What was your most, what, what do you remember as your best interdisciplinary experience? Start. So at this, I think the Stanford School of Medicine does a fantastic job of this. It's literally mixing like surgery with computer science, with mechanical engineering. Uh, I worked at the Stem Cell Institute for two years doing research. I think, I think our most important breakthroughs and technological advancements were literally from, from other professors, from other departments coming in and saying, hey, have you guys ever thought of you know, attaching electrodes to those cells? Or have you ever thought about passing a current through something? And these are just things that I, I feel like individuals are so siloed in, in their own particular research areas that in any other institution, if you didn't have that kind of cross-pollination of ideas and that constant dialogue between people, you just wouldn't get those advancements. And, and it's physically obvious when you come here now. We were commenting before we came in. I mean, the buildings that are here that weren't here even 10 years ago, and they're all right next to each other, and they're physically facilitating cross-pollination between the different departments is amazing. I mean, I studied product design, which is a hybrid of mechanical engineering and art design. Um, and at the time, that was a really big deal. And now it's, it's those types of people working with people in the med school, working with people in the E department, I mean, it's, um, it's really fantastic. I think a lot of new businesses are going to come out of those types of opportunities as opposed to the more traditional silo double E situation or CS only situation. It's pretty exciting. Given the rigor of, of technical undergrads, I mean, did any of you really go off the grid? I mean, dance class, archaeology, touchy-feely, I mean, you know. I took, took PolySci, at the time PolySci 138 was like national security strategy where we literally spent the time doing three-day simulations of UN negotiations. Totally Not unrelated. Quite salsa, but it wasn't quite salsa. <laughs> I'm really uncoordinated, so salsa would have been bad for everybody. Yeah. Which is a little unusual uh, here, so uh, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any? Yeah. Roll off. Sure. Answer the question elliptically with another example. Sure. <laughs> Since I was at the business school and we were, you know, isolated across the street. It was a little harder to get access to the rest of campus. But one of the companies we backed is with a Stanford graduate who got a PhD in electrical engineering, undergrad in physics, who uh, is Ashkenazi. And his sister had a child that was born with a, a disease that killed the baby within a week of birth in 2002. And he came back to Stanford as an associate professor. And he spent over a year reading all the biology and genomics books that he could, access to faculty. Uh, and he used that cross-pollination of his double E training to solve problems in biology that the biologists and geneticists didn't have the insight for. And today he has this company that enables uh, thousands of people to have healthy babies every year. Wow. And that to me is a fantastic wow. example of cross-pollinating uh, disciplines to come up with breakthrough innovation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to say from, from teaching here, one of the things I love about um, the course that I teach, and I know this is true of many other places, is that we'll have freshmen with CS grad students with Sloan Fellows all in the same room talking about things. Um, I really feel, you know, it's interesting because when the freshmen come into the class, there's a natural inclination to look at the guy next to you um, who's twice your age and think, oh my god, I'm at a super disadvantage here because this person has more experience. And then it turns out that the dialogue is really amazing. And so I feel like, like there's also that opportunity to to sort of cross-pollinate people from, from literally you know, different generations at Stanford to be able to do things that are really interesting. I think it's one of the great things we have going for us here. So, um, so last question from me, and then I'll, I'd love to open it up to the audience. Um, there's been a great debate today about whether the whole higher education system is even relevant, appropriate, state of the art. Um, Stanford is, of course, leading the way with a tremendous amount of online education. Uh, certainly a, a, a former key PayPal executive who might remain nameless has been talking about the fact that, you know, higher education might be obsolete and, you know, maybe, we, maybe, maybe you should all just save your money and not stay in school. Um, that's the extreme view of that. But it is, it is a question. I mean, you know, as, as I have students, the, the pull of Silicon Valley, the pull to go stop out, um, take time off, or take time, you know, <laughs> leave, and who knows when you're going to come back. And, and there are students who always say to me, well, you know, that's what Bill Gates did, and that's what Steve Jobs did, and that's what Mark Zuckerberg did. And so 
And once again, I have to say, well, the chance you're going to be one of them is small, but, uh, but anyway, the point being, there is a lot of attraction to go out. There's a lot of opportunity for Stanford students to stop studying and go do something else. How do you feel about that? What would you counsel someone who's a student here? Um, stay in school, do that. What, what would you do today, and what would you recommend our students do? How different is that than, a, a, than an athlete getting the same opportunity? I, it's similar, I think. It, it's, um, you know, for the right opportunity, it can definitely be worth it. So I don't, I don't think I would be one to say stay in school no matter what. And Stanford has very liberal policies about such things. So that's nice uh, in and of itself. Um, you have to be really passionate and really good at something in order for that path to make sense in my mind. You have to sort of be a bit of a savant in a certain area or, or really exceptionally skilled in a, in a particular technical area for that to make sense. For me, I know I needed as much time as I could stay here to figure it out. And I was here six years counting the code term and a seventh probably would have done me some good. So it was good to be here as long as I could at the time. Um, but that was my pace, so. <laughs> I mean, I'm obviously a little biased because I, I did stop out of school after, after the first two years. Um, I, I do agree that unless there's the right opportunity and it's something you're really passionate about and something that if you're sitting in a classroom, all you'd be thinking about is like, I want to get back to, to that project, probably not worth it. But I will say, at least in my own experience, it's been an incredible set of other skills that I've learned um, outside of the classroom that I think are, are invaluable. And, Again, Stanford does have really liberal policies on coming back to school. So if the right opportunity presents itself, it's, it's definitely worth, you know, if you're willing to take that risk and, and dive in, definitely worth it. I think that's right. I've, always, I've had a couple of people ask me this about, you know, should I, should I stop out and do this? And, and my attitude has always been, I'm going to tell you no, you shouldn't. And if you turn around and say, I'm doing it anyways, then you're probably the right candidate to do this. Right? Which is like, I think if, if it's really the right opportunity, you are going to be so into it and so headstrong that somebody telling you not to do it actually kind of doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so on the, on the flip side, if you're, if you're kind of like, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, and some random guy like me says don't do it and you don't, probably good you didn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any? I think I mean, I've, I've met many of the companies that are endeavoring to upend the education system and um, familiar with Khan Academy and I you know, love what they've enabled in terms of, you know, providing that sort of education at your fingertips. Again, having grown up in you know, a country very far from here, it's wonderful to sit in Cape Town and be able to you know, observe the lectures and learn from the best minds in the world and whatever your chosen discipline is. Um, and I'm sure there's some changes that should be made at the margin with your standard curriculum and, and course of education. Because if you go back to you know, the Renaissance, the teaching was essentially the same with you know, literally, if you see pictures of what lectures look like uh, 400 years ago, 300 years ago, they, ha they haven't really changed. Clearly, there's an opportunity to incorporate technology to make it different. Um, but I'd argue the, the biggest opportunity is, is post leaving a university. It's the continuing education where I think is, is probably the biggest opportunity because so many people stop learning when they're 22 or 23 and they graduate. And that, you know, that's terrible when you think about your whole lifetime and people just get stunted. And, I certainly got a lot of satisfaction mm -hmm. out of taking one of the computer science classes that were offered through Stanford um, last year, mm -hmm. the machine learning class. I had a, had a blast taking the course and programming again. It was just it was fun to be able to, to test your limits. And I wonder whether that's the real opportunity mm -hmm. long term. I think the, the other subtle thing that often gets missed when you just look at, um, you know, could you learn faster? You know, could, could we all be in an accelerated program, skip summers, and you know, just blast through your curriculum as quickly as, as you can? But what about all those other social things that you learn along the way? Mm -hmm. Your ability to relate to others, your ability to work in a, in a group as a team, to assume leadership, to be, to be led, to negotiate with others. Because those are the sort of interpersonal skills that are hugely important to your success down the road. I mean, you're a business school student as well. The classes that have stuck with me the most a decade later have been the softer classes, things around leadership and human resource management and motivation. Um, very subtle things around how to get the most out of people. Mm -hmm. I think to follow on on that, I think entrepreneurship is a, is a team sport for the most part. And if you look at the founding teams, the particularly successful ones, very often they met at Stanford or met at their places of, of education. 
if you hadn't been in the room with the other person all that all those times, would you have started a company with them? And I, I think it is it's one of the interesting things I hear from the online entrepreneurs is how do I meet my founding team members because they don't have that experience. So I mean I think it's fantastic what Stanford is doing and the innovation that Stanford is trying to progress and, and doing it so much of it at no cost to the to the greater and to the world community and it's a really incredible thing. But I would argue that for students um, this is my stay in school kids message. Uh, but, but my argument is I think Stanford is really intelligent to have a very lenient stopping out thing. But there's a point at which you've stopped out too long and you, can't, and you, sort of, you just can't do it anymore. Uh, so I would just encourage people that I think that the connections that you make here, the relationships that you build here, the type of learning that happens. And you know, I, I do believe the degree has value in many other ways as well. I, I know for me, I got kind of tired of undergrad, and then I left, and then I came back to go to business school, and I really appreciated classes more when I was a business school student. So I do think coming and going is a, is a, is a good thing, but I would encourage you to come back. The other thing I think that is different today than certainly was when I was a student is if you're an entrepreneur, you can almost you know, get your entire degree done and focus on your company at the same time by, by taking all the courses in which you can explore things that are important to your company. And I see a lot of students doing that, where they, they literally you know, line up their courses and say, OK, I can, I'm going to do my marketing in this class, and I'm going to do my development in this class, and I'm going to write my business plan here. And it's fascinating what you can do with, uh, with Stanford and what they have to offer today. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to open it up. We have about 10 minutes for questions. And yes, uh, please go ahead. My question is the uh, tangents of your last question, maybe, about the uh, 20 under 20 program. Uh, I myself uh, studied computer science here and uh, had a, one entrepreneurial experience so far in New York State. I'm also one of the mentors, fortunate enough to be one of the mentors at the Seed Foundation 20 under 20 program. Uh -huh. My question is dual. One is, uh, is entrepreneurship something one can learn, or most of the reason someone is an entrepreneur is what they come with in the world? That's one question. And second, and I'm sure Terry has a plan. Uh, but so much. And the second question I have is uh, uh, with respect to Silicon Valley, obviously we have a lot of things going on for us here, including a gathering of this, right? Um, <coughs> what if you want to replicate that in other parts of the US? What do you think are some of the considerations given the various regions, Midwest, uh, Texas, uh, and uh, North America? Entrepreneurs, can it be taught? Well, so it can't be taught. That's an interesting question. I think for a lot of people that end up coming here, and I'll just speak about my particular case, I hardly knew what it was when I, when I got here. So for me, being exposed to entrepreneurship and people starting companies and doing all this neat stuff um, was sort of the first thing. And so whether that existed somewhere um, deep down that I didn't know about beforehand and then was just revealed because I was in this environment um, I think is the, 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 my particular situation. The, I, I am one of the lieutenants in, in my current company. I'm not the actual founder. And the actual founder of the company is a, a brilliant technologist um, who's a little different than a lot of us, and um, certainly different than me. And um, he's special. And I, I think there is an innate um, thing in, in a lot of people that allows them to start a company when um, it's very challenging to make a living doing that. Um, and we as a company have had our backs against the wall a number of different times and then been successful kind of coming out of that. So for me, I wasn't the entrepreneur, I wasn't the entrepreneur, but part of a founding team and a very early employee was kind of more the role that made sense for me. Um, and it's something that only would have been unveiled had I been in a, in a, in a place like this. So. I think to, to this point, like you can teach a lot of the skills so you can go learn sort of finance, or you can go learn, you can learn marketing or hiring, whatever it is. I do think there's something a little bit different. There's actually a really interesting book written by a Hopkins uh, med school prof called The Hypomanic Edge, the link between a little crazy and a lot of success in America. And the argument basically goes that entrepreneurs are, there's a high correlation between the way entrepreneurs describe themselves and the way that hypomanics describe themselves. And hypomania is basically a, it's basically a reduced version of manic depressive disorder. Um, it's a really interesting study. Um, but it basically says it's things like the ability to operate on very little sleep and lots of energy and the ability to kind of consistently be told no and not believe that you're wrong. <laughs> Which, by the way, could be a really good or a really bad thing. Um, but there's a, there's a certain set of skills that you would kind of associate with entrepreneurs and kind of this, this category of being 
special, as Kit gently put it, uh, most people would just call it crazy, that I don't know that you can teach. Um, so I think there's kind of some qualities that are, are very inherent and just you either have them or you don't and it's not a good or bad, it's just different. And there's a bunch of things you can very much learn about it. Yeah, you can teach frameworks, you can teach methodologies, you can look at case studies, see how other people have done things, but when it comes time to actually making your own company, you almost forget all of that. It's, it's all in the moment, it's all about like how passionate you are. You'll have 30 people telling you you can't do it, but, but you're still gonna push through. And I think at that point, pattern recognition becomes important. Like look, I, I've seen, I've read case studies, or I've seen other people hit these same roadblocks, so I kind of know what not to do, but like there, there's no book on, on how to make every single decision and, and how to kind of go when, when, once you've made the decision to start a company, like what is the step by step on how to make it successful. But there are a lot of great entrepreneurs out there who I'm sure are not in places in the world where they have the ability to go out and start a company. I mean, the best pianist in the world may never have seen a piano, right? So, um, who just has that innate capability inside of them. So, you know, making sure that you're getting exposed to and aware of the ability to start a business, um, that's an important first step, obviously. No. I don't know if they still do it. When I got my acceptance letter to Stanford, it came in this folder, and the front was printed something along the lines of, for all the nights you stayed up late to get something done, for all the nights you didn't go out with your friends to finish, to go the extra mile on that project, blah, blah, blah. Like all these traits they considered special to Stanford students. I still have this folder today. Like I, I read it and I was like, wow, like there's something inside of me that was kind of like, wow, that's, that's really cool. Um, it's very similar to a lot of the traits I think you would kind of consider inherent in entrepreneurial, in entrepreneurs, which is maybe exactly your point with this study. There's something special about the way that Stanford chooses people or trains people. I think the other thing, and it's why we're all here is because I've heard time and time again from students, they say, I wasn't sure I could do it, and then I came in and I met, and I listened to someone at, you know, at ETL or in another class, and they talked about their failures, and they sounded sort of like I think of myself, and then they went off and were successful. And so I think a lot of times it is back to that pattern recognition. If you know that someone else who sounds like you did, did it, it gives you that, that moment to, to keep going and, and to do it. I, I want to say before we run out of time, that you can find the study at bit.ly uh, slash Stanford Innovation Study. And I suspect if you search for it, you'll probably find it too. Is the but on Yahoo, though? Yeah. <laughs> <Stanford> grads. <laughs> so I think we have time for uh, one or two more questions. So yeah. Yes. I have a question for Rolf about the Silicon Valley ecosystem. It seems like there's a tremendous amount of money from the venture community going into software startups and not that much into hardware anymore. Now, is the, do you think that Valley's gonna lose the hardware design DNA if that trend continues? It's a, it's a very strong risk. That it'll lose it. I mean, I'm involved with a hardware company, Jawbone. It makes a Jambox speaker and a noise canceling headset. Um, and uh, th they really struggle to find manufacturing talent because so much of that has left the Bay Area. So I think the, the best hope that it'll stick around. If, I mean, there are a couple of people that have written about some of the, the hardware companies that are now innovating around the Bay Area, what they call accessory companies, companies that are building you know, hardware that accompanies a piece of software on your smartphone you know, to help it do what it does. I think that's the best chance we have of some interesting hardware companies around here. One more question. Um, let's see. Go right. Yes. Yes, you. So uh, in the Stanford community, there are a lot of um, highly technically skilled innovators and people who are taking their research and making companies out of it. But then you know, there are other people in other places in the world that might not even have a college degree that are starting up businesses. Maybe they'll start a small business, a um, clothing line, a bike shop, things like that. So I guess. How do you find the balance between those two extremes? If you have a product in mind, how far do you try to innovate it in your head and try to be creative about it before you say, oh, I can make a company out of it? The way that we've done it, you go as fast as you can and go try it in the market, right? And this is whether you read Eric Ries and Lean Startup or um, one of the 37 Signals guys, Jason Frieder, David Hilmar Hansen, one said that if you look back at the product you launched originally and you're not embarrassed, you waited too long to launch it. 
Right, the market's always right. So I think you, you go and you try to, innovating in your head is kind of easy and fun in a way, but it, it doesn't really tell you the truth. It just tells you what you think. So I'd say go do it. And you're right, that's the interesting question about training. There's a lot of people who are entrepreneurs who have no formal training in it whatsoever. Um, I think you can make it easier or better for you. Just Stanford and, and, and Silicon Valley certainly hasn't cornered the market on entrepreneurship. I mean, it's alive and well all over the world. Our, our, our society and our cultures were based on it. And I mean, I think we shouldn't, as, as well as, as Stanford has done, let's not lose sight of the fact that competitive is, competitiveness is global at this point, And there's lots of really exciting things going on. Lots of other places by people who have that same attitude about striking out. So um, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank our guests. Thank you for coming back to the farm. Thank you.